so in order to explain this whole collision theory and rate of reaction thing, like you called it before, um, I'm going to get some notes from Ms. Hans' chem class. I used to get an A minus every trimester besides for the second one. Uh, you must have been stupid the second trimester. Might be. Might be. Great. Number one, reactive molecules must come together in order to react. Okay, so in order for me to hit you or react to you, my glove or collision particle must come in contact with you. Like I so. Said. Oh. Number two, reactive molecules must collide in order for the reaction to occur. So in order for me to do any damage to you and actually break the bond, I actually have to really try hit you either in the stomach or in the face. Number three, you can make a reaction go faster by increasing the number of collisions. So, of course, the more hits I get to you, the more damage I'll do to you. Ah, <laughs> oh, God. Reminds me of my days at Annapolis. Molecules must collide at a certain orientation to react, because not all collisions end in a product. All right, so say I were to hit you below the waist, like that, not actually. Um, like you, I would get disqualified, because that's not allowed by the rules. It's not in the correct orientation. But, say I were to hit you above the waist, like say your ribs, oh, oh god, that would you made me poop myself. Number five, reactant molecules must have enough kinetic energy to break their bonds. So in order for me to break your bonds or your ribs, I need to hit you with a lot of force. No! And finally, number six, the energy required for the initial breaking of the bonds is that activation energy. Alright, so activation energy is the energy required to start a reaction. Now, a boxer's activation energy can either be his hatred for the pwn boxer, you, or maybe all the training he's done, or the yearning to be the world's greatest, fly like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Wait, what? Like I said, activation energy is the energy required uh, to start a reaction. So, if not all the prior things, then it's definitely the boxer's training. Uh, he has to build up the enough, enough energy and strength in order to really hit that opponent and really like get him down to the ground. Have you, have you seen Rocky IV? Yes, I have, many times. Nice. So, you know how Rocky, had, there's just, like that whole montage, uh, how he like trains and everything? Yes, yes I do. Alright, so at the end, when he beats Drago, all that energy paid off because he had that activation energy to really just, you know, like, punch him and hit him hard. You get it? Yes, the Soviet got hit in the face. And please don't tell me you forgot about catalysts. What? Alright, so by definition, a catalyst provides an alternate route for the reaction with a lower activation energy. So it does not lower the activation energy of the reaction. There's a subtle difference between the two statements that is easily illustrated with a simple analogy. Suppose you have a mountain between two valleys so that the only way for people to get from one valley to the other is to go over the mountain. Only the most active and energetic people will manage to get from one valley to the other. Now suppose a tunnel is cut through the mountain. Many more people will now manage to get from one valley to the other by this easier route. You could say that the, tunnel, that the tunnel's route has a lower activation energy than going over the mountain. But you haven't lowered the mountain. The tunnel has provided an alternate route but hasn't lowered the original one. The original mountain is still there and some people will still choose to climb it. In, in the chemistry case, if particles collide with enough energy, they can still react in, the exact, in exactly the same way as if the catalyst wasn't even there. It is simply that the majority of particles will react via the easier catalyzed route. So really, I get everything you just said, except you never really made a whole little comparison there between surface area and a little bit of boxing. That's right. I totally forgot. All right, um, stand open. Come at me, bro. All right. Anyway, so, um, remember the Alice Seltzer experiment? Yes, I do. All right, so right now, you're the crush of Alice Seltzer. Yes, I am. All open and whatnot. Me being the colliding particle... Yes, you are. ...can attack at you much easier and faster when you're all open like this, right? right? Yeah. If you were to stand open like this for the whole fight, I would get you down much easier, right? Yeah. Exactly, because you're all open. Now, get in field position. 
Alright, so now you're the full pill of Alka-Seltzer. If you were to stay like this the whole fight, it would take me a long time to really get, um, to really get at you. So you're going to have to go at every single layer, one at a time, until you finally give in. This is just like the full pill of Alka-Seltzer. While it took a while to uh, decompose since the colliding particles, had to break the large clump at a bunt, one level at a time. Please tell me you get it. I feel so exposed, but I do. Baruch Hashem, he gets it! So, any other questions? Actually, yes I do. Fuck my life. So what are some real life applications for this whole collision theory thing? Uh, Al, you take it from here. Well, first off, we have Alka-Seltzer. Even though its role did present it as an experiment, it's a real world application. Another real world application is a volcano. When a volcano explodes, the temperature of the lava increases. And the kinetic energy of the particles increase in the lava, which causes more collision. As the temperature rises, it causes the lava to spew out of the volcano as an explosion. I see, I see. Very interesting indeed. Yeah, uh, can we go now? Yeah, this video is kind of getting a little bit long. Yeah, well, we hope you enjoyed this edition of Sports Center. Chemistry I edition. I know, I sure did. You know you're adopted. Not again! Please enjoy no. these next few clips and enjoy your day. Yeah! <laughs> Swinging London!